Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria and Eastern Antique Arms. I have spoken a lot in the past about one of my favourite models of, models of sword, that is the Victorian Infantry Officer's Sword, the 1845 pattern, sometimes known as the 1854 pattern, which um, depends on a variation in the guard, which we're not going to talk about in this video, I've talked about it previously. But what really defines the 1845 pattern Infantry Officer's Sword is this style of fullered blade. As you'll know it looks very similar to um, various cavalry swords of the time and it really is quite a strong um, cut and thrust blade that's fairly good at lots of things. It's a good compromise average design. But what be what came before this? So often you see people refer to this model of sword as the 1822 pattern. It is not the 1822 pattern because of the blade. This blade only came into use from 1845 onwards, at least officially so. Before that was the 1822 pattern. Now the 1822 pattern, which I've got one of here, um, is very, very similar looking sword at first sight. You'll see that it's got basically the same style hilt. It has the folding side hilt section, which makes it easier to wear against the body. And that was in use on the later type of blade as well, that was on in use until about 1860. By about 1860, it kind of got abandoned because this often got broken or malfunctioned or was just generally a nuisance and it wasn't regarded as being particularly strong either for combat use. So they replaced that with this one piece solid guard in um, officially in 1854 according to the dress regulations which is why we sometimes refer to the 1854 pattern. However, Unofficially, these were still being made up until about 1859-1860, okay? But looking at the blade, this is the really important part and what we're going to talk about um, hopefully concisely in this video. And this is the blade that came before the fuller blade. Now if I just hold them up next to each other, you'll see that they have superficially they're the same sort of size, the same sort of width, the same sort of curvature. But there are some important differences. Now first of all, look at those tips you will see that one tip, uh, the one at the top here, which is the later one, the 45 blade, is spear pointed. That means it's a symmetrical point. The lower blade here is asymmetrical. That is the point is towards the back of the blade. Now, the spear pointed blade is without a shadow of a doubt better at thrusting. Blades that have a point at the rear of the, uh, of the blade, towards the spine, the back of the blade, when they hit something, they naturally want to divert and push away from it. Okay, If you have a symmetrical point, it's better at piercing. But the most important difference between the 45 blade and the 22 blade, which came first, is this is what's called a pipe back blade. Now, I have spoken about pipe back blades before. You find them on uh, not just on British swords, although it does seem to have been a British invention. It seems that the pipe back blade was probably invented by the sword maker Prosser, um, who was based, I believe, in Charing Cross, but in London. So a London sword maker by the name of Prosser. And Prosser probably designed the entire infantry officer's sword uh, with, some, with some additional input, um, but the pipe back blade had come into use in the late Napoleonic period when applied to broad cutting blades as found on the 1796 like cavalry sabre or indeed um, infantry officer's sabres like this. Now when the pipe back is applied to a broad blade, particularly a broad slightly curved blade, it's actually very effective because what you do is you put the, the rigidity and the mass of the blade at the back and then you have a very flat, thin section of blade in front. So what you do is you essentially make a very, um, a very small gradient behind the edge, which means you can have an exceptionally sharp edge. It's a bit like a razor actually. A very, very sharp and fine and thin edge that is very, very good at cutting for that first width of blade. but Obviously you will realise with the pipe back there is a rod section, as you can hopefully see, a rod section up the back, and that does of course, once the blade goes into a target, produce a lot of friction once you get to that rod section. However, is it really much more than you get at the back of a fullered blade? Because at the back of a fullered blade you have a similar thing, you have, you have a broadening again at the back ridge. Um, so that's debatable, but one of the objections to the pipe back was in cutting, this rod would produce more friction. So even though the edge could be sharper and finer and thinner, 
you would still meet resistance when you got to the back of the blade. There is a bigger problem with pipe back blades, uh, and that is when it's applied to a thin, a, a relatively narrow blade like this, not like the earlier sabre blades like this, it seems to work okay on a broad blade. But when you apply the pipe back to a narrower blade like this, it has a couple of problems. Firstly, it means that the majority of the width of your blade is now a very thin piece of steel. That means when it collides with other thin pieces of steel, they put huge great notches in each other and it makes it relatively fragile. Okay? The second problem is it's really um, not very stiff at all for thrusting. Okay? It makes quite a, an unrigid, shall we say, I won't go as far as to call it floppy, but um, an unrigid blade. As it happens, this example I'm holding here is actually quite a rigid one, but I've had many of these pass through my hands over the years, and many of them are incredibly dainty, incredibly light, and really too bendy. Now coupled with the, so the bendiness coupled with the fact that you've got this asymmetrical point means that when you try and run someone through, if they're wearing a thick winter coat then this doesn't penetrate easily, it's going to go wang and it's not going to penetrate what you're thrusting at. And in fact this is mentioned in the historical accounts that people with certain types of blades simply couldn't thrust through heavy winter clothing. It's mentioned in the Crimean War. The Crimean War, of course, was in 1854 to 56, which means that both of these blade types were in use at that time because officers who'd joined the army before 1845 had this type of sword, and officers who joined the army after 1845 had this type of sword. In some cases, officers who had this type of sword, when this type of sword came out, they bought one of the new ones. Um, and so some of the old officers did have the newer swords. But nevertheless, there were officers running around in the Crimean War, and indeed if we go earlier into the Sikh Wars, which were in the 1840s, who had these. And frankly, this is just not a great blade. Now, it's not terrible. I wouldn't go as far as to say that the pipe back is as terrible as some, as some people have made out. In actual fact, I have some pipe backs in my collection which I consider to be very good and some of the most beautifully handling um, blades that I have and I would trust them in combat. But what what separates, I think, one of those good pipe backs from a bad pipe back is to do with essentially the amount of steel in the blade. My personal opinion is that a pipe back blade works really well if the blade is made meaty enough or broad enough. So if the blade is quite thick, that kind of works. If you make it broad, that kind of works. What really doesn't work, and unfortunately lots of manufacturers uh, between 1822 and 1845 were trying to make these swords as light as possible. And if you make the blade really narrow and really thin, you end up basically with a useless sword blade that's useless for thrusting, useless for cutting, and in parrying, something like a tulwar, well, good luck to you, <laughs> okay? Um, however, this is a fairly robust example. I suspect that this might be a prosser, and ironically, prosser who um, thought up this design, or not ironically, I suppose, poetically we should say, prosser who thought up this design, actually seems to have made some of the best versions of this design. Um, so there we go, it was actually a lot of the cheaper copies of the pipe back that aren't very good. So there we go, the 1822 pattern infantry officer sword with a pipe back blade, replaced this type of blade, uh, replaced or rather superseded in 1845 by the, by the later Fullard blade, and what characterises it is the asymmetrical point it does have a false edge, incidentally, with a what's sometimes known as a quill, um, a kind of almost like a yellman at the back. So asymmetrical point with a false edge, um, and then it's edged all the way down, obviously, um, with a pipe back up to there, at which point it transitions into the false edge. And then the hilt is very much the same as the later Victorian um, infantry officer's hilt, made of brass, gilt covered, with a shark skin grip, um, brass wire, sometimes silver wire, around. And um, this style of hilt, in fact, was in use until 1895 officially. So the hilt remained in use for a very long time. But as I mentioned, the folding, the folding side section to the guard generally became fixed and no longer folding from 1860 onwards. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.